In today's video, Percival Everett's retelling of Huckleberry Finn, James, Life as a Funeral Crier in Wee Yan Lu's debut novel, Hernan Cortez and Montezuma meet in You Dream of Empire, Holly Gramazeo writes about an attic of infinite husbands, Andrew O'Hagan's new novel Collodian Road, Coming of Age with a Dysfunctional Mother in Violan Holtzman's hit French novel, Mala Nunn writes about race and boarding school in Swaziland, a Bosnian refugee faces prejudice in Finland in My Cat Yugoslavia, a Good Happy Girl by Marissa Higgins, Marta by Kavid Akbar, and Richard Flanagan invents a new genre of book in Question 7. Hello and welcome to Gunpowder Fiction and Plot. My name is Scott and if you're new here, this is a channel where I review books, specifically new releases, literary fiction and global literature. I've got 12 books to talk about today, two of which are DNF, the other 10 of which I have mostly positive things to say. And I really think today's books has something for every reader. It's quite diverse, not just because I've got queer authors, translated book, a, a Chinese author, an Irani author, a Bosnian Finnish author, a Swaziland author, but stylistically diverse. So let's start with the DNFs. Collodian Road by Andrew O'Hagan. The last Andrew O'Hagan book I read, Mayflies, I just can't stop recommending it. This one, at 600 odd pages, it just feels like the juice is not worth the squeeze. This is a political satire, and I don't feel that the satire was landing. What's that make it a political novel? It just felt a bit cliche. It felt too close to home and entirely too obvious to work for me. This read like a really poor Evelyn War novel. Fruits of the Dead by Rachel Lyon. This is a retelling of Hades and Persephone's or Demeter and Persephone. Following Corey, who was an 18 year old camp counselor who gets a job when Rollo witnesses her being nice to his son who might be special needs or autistic, but it was unclear by the point I pulled the plug on this novel. He is definitely a victim of bullying, however. Rolo drives Corey back to his house on an island away from everything with no phone reception and an NDA, so Corey isn't even allowed to tell anybody where she is. And then he gives her a drug that his company is making. Look, this was really slow. And I think I'm usually patient with younger characters, younger protagonists doing stupid things. Young characters are naive. They make mistakes. They're very intelligent people who can do very stupid things. As somebody who identifies as both very intelligent and very stupid, I get this. But this book was too slow. It was kind of like Rachel Lyon expected that I would agree with Corey's stupid mistakes and be equally shocked as her when she landed her herself in an unsafe place, as if doing drugs with a 40 year old man who clearly has a hard on for you at a place where nobody knows where you are is who thinks that's a clever idea. But it was this creep Rollo, I just couldn't get behind him. He wasn't landing, he didn't seem realistic to me, he lacked the charm of a sexual predator. You Dream of Empire by Elvaro Enrique, translated from Spanish by Natasha Wimmer. We're into the books that I finished and going from worst to best now, and this is a historical fiction retelling of Hernan Cortes and his conquistadors entering the city of Tecnochilitan, which is modern day Mexico City, and and they're meeting with Montezuma. Do apologize for butchering that word, but he's in a language that nobody speaks anymore. This is a relatively short book and positives. I really enjoyed the drawing of this city, the setting, the culture, but the characters were pretty poorly drawn. And this is especially disappointing as a lot of characters had names in the Nathutul language, and some of them had multiple names. And both of those two things makes it a little bit hard as a reader. Authors get around that by having well-drawn characters. Authors that do that and have badly drawn characters, they don't get away with this. Add to that that the plot was pretty terribly written too. It was a real disorganized mess of a novel. It was hard to follow, and as a result, the intrigue and the politics of the place went completely over my head. Hard to tell if this is a fault with the original text or the translation, but a writing style that I really struggled with. Still, there is value in this book. The immersion in the culture and location it brings is 
very interesting. As I go from worst book to best book, this is a point in the video where the praise starts to outnumber the criticism. Everything to Come is essentially a good book. A Good Happy Girl by Marissa Higgins. This is another messy novel, but this time it's quite intentional. Helen has a type, married lesbian couples. Look, I've read a lot of queer books before, but I have never read a book that is exploring being a thruple before, and I would really like to read more thruple books. And I challenge anybody watching this video, I challenge you not to find the idea of thruples to be at least curious. Helen's parents have committed a disturbing crime, and her relationship with them is really messed up. It's complex and hard for Helen to get her head around while they're in prison. And we we can really witness Helen looking for a relationship that she didn't have with her parents through her relationships with Catherine and Katrina. They're both pseudo parents to her. Meanwhile, the married couple keep getting more emotionally and sexually intense, keeping Helen interested in the relationship. Helen's sexual preferences and desires are pretty out there, and you can probably say that there's some trauma, and trying to repurpose that is potentially the cause of some of this, but what those sexual kinks do is they help build this character, this insecure and a little bit outrageous character. And Helen must have been a very hard character to build and draw. She has depth. She is completely uneven, at times highly functioning, but more often she's pretty dysfunctional. A character whose shit is way too recent in her past for her to have sorted it out by now. This is a really messy and slightly chaotic book that very much will not work for every reader. It is going to divide readers. At times it's disgusting and at times you do wonder, do we really need to hear that? But it is quite effective at building this character. When the Ground is Hard by Mala Nunn. This is a young adult novel from Swaziland about two girls who are outsiders and pushed together at a boarding school. Adele is one of the popular girls, but when Delilah says you're out, you're out. And she is forced to hang out with Lottie, who is underprivileged or just simply poor and bullied because of it. Lottie is friendly towards Adele, but Adele doesn't think of her as a friend to begin with. But they begin to form a bond over books, particularly Jane Eyre. And I can't help but think that the choice of Jane Eyre is not accidental when you consider where that book is set at the beginning and where these girls are in this novel. But this book is really about money and power and being a woman and the black-white divide. When a boy at the school goes missing, Lottie and Adele put their heads together and try and solve the case, and this shows us the underbelly of life in Swaziland. A lot of this book is about the racial divide in Swaziland, which didn't have apartheid like their southern neighbours, but have a lot of the same views and racism that caused apartheid in their culture. Adele has a black mother and a white father, but her father has another family and the normality of this was a bit shocking. I think the treatment of mixed race people by black and white society is one of the best demonstrations of how white society is so much more racist than black society. I don't know if that was the intention of Nunn or if because that's just a reality of the situation and Nunn was being true to her own experiences, that sung through. But these mixed race girls were very much treated differently by black and white people. I think this is a fantastic book. I think it's enjoyable to read. My criticism of it is that it is pretty obvious and it's not doing anything that hasn't been done a hundred times before by other novels. But it was successful in doing what it intended to do. It was enjoyable to read and I learned about Swaziland, a country I knew nothing about. My Cat Yugoslavia by Pajdim Stanovici, translated from Finnish by David Haxam. There are two timelines to this novel. In the 1980s, a young Muslim Bosnian girl is married off to a man she hardly knows. The other timeline is a modern day timeline based in Finland and following Beckham, the gay son of refugees who fled Yugoslavia. Beckham begins a relationship with a rather horrible cat. And this section takes on an almost master and margarita style absurdity. And while I think the Russian classic really mastered the dark comedy, 
I do think this book is comical and enjoyable in places while tackling some rather dark issues. While a talking cat does mean that this is a magical realism novel, it is relatively gentle on the magical realism. There is a talking cat and that is all. While the cat definitely symbolises something, as too does the snake, which doesn't talk, I think it offers insight into discrimination. Beckham is gay and an immigrant, and we see him discriminated upon because of these things, more so in this novel because he is an immigrant. But how would you label a man in a relationship with a cat? They are definitely lovers at some point, but are they gay or straight? What is the nationality of the cat? Is he a real cat or a person simply calling him a cat? Is he anthropomorphized? Is he literally a house pet? And the cat is saying all these horrible things to Beckham. He's a real homophobic racist, selfish cat who is using Beckham's hospitality. He is gay by our definition, but he constantly tells Beckham he is not one of your types. The absurdity of a cat being in this relationship is really demonstrating to us that labelling somebody is arbitrary and prejudice becomes hypocritical. Beckham's mother's timeline starts to include some domestic violence and abuse, which rather than being a conversation about women's rights and feminism, really colours the family unit in the later timeline. The family fleeing Yugoslavia, and I'm sure we all know the histories related to Yugoslavia enough to know that some pretty bad shit is about to go down. That is contrasted perfectly with the racism inside Finnish society. It again makes the situation absurd. It's almost like the Finnish are saying, well, what's wrong with your country? Ethnic cleansing, you say? Not good, not good, but, you know, stiff up a lip and all that. And hey, look on the bright side. Bosnia has a much better climate than Finland. I think it's to the detriment of the mother's timeline that she is really used to colour the son's timeline. I mean, it's almost a really good thing. The past does colour the future, but she could have been written with more emotion and more understanding as in being as central to the story as Beckham while still doing that. Beckham seems to be very much an author insert character, strongly influenced by Pat Chim's own life. And I kind of left this book wanting to know more about his mother, wanting to be immersed more in her story. Overall, I'd say this was quite a good novel. This is Stachovici's first novel, and I would say it is of similar quality to his more recent novel, Bowler, but maybe not quite as good. A small improvement between the two novels, I would say. I read this as part of my Patreon book club, so it seems like the ideal time to thank my wonderful Patreons. We read two books a month together, and one is always translated, and then we chat about them in a video call. I love hearing other people's thoughts on these books that we read, and especially this one that we just read, because it was a little bit wackadoodle. And other people often see things that just didn't occur to me. You know, we all read books from our own point of view, from our own experiences and our own knowledge. And I just can't help but to think of how lucky we are to be enriched by other people's points of view. So if you'd like to support this channel, please consider signing up to the Patreon and joining us. Question 7 by Richard Flanagan. Flanagan is looking at his past and he's taking seemingly random events from the last century and linking them to his father's life and a rafting accident he was involved with when he was younger. Essentially Flanagan is saying that an encounter between Rebecca West and H.G. Wells profoundly impacted and unintentionally completely changed the course of his life, even though that event happened before he was born. This is the cue for Flanagan to tell a series of seemingly disconnected stories. There's stuff about Einstein, there's stuff about Hiroshima, and Flanagan's own father's experience as a prisoner of war. And when Flanagan has finished telling these very loosely connected stories, I not only agree with his absurd claim that an unlikely romance between two of the best authors of their generation impacted his life, but also by extension, I'm convinced that my life and everybody else's 
life was impacted by their romance too. This book sits somewhere between a non-fiction history, a historical fiction, a memoir, and an autofiction. It has been labelled as genre-defying, and it is such an overused label, but in this case, it is very apt. I am literally not sure whether this is a fiction or a non-fiction book. Australia has some remarkable authors at the moment, but it's hard to imagine who could beat out Richard Flanagan as Australia's best author going around at the moment. And even if you can find somebody better than him, I think it's very uncontroversial to acknowledge him as a very rare talent who has written a book in question seven that evades classification. The Funeral Crier by Wee Yang Lu. This is a novel about a woman who takes up funeral crying as a job because her lazy good-for-nothing husband doesn't work. Going into this book, my knowledge of funeral criers was that they exist. I didn't realize that there was even a prejudice against them because of their association with death, which I think is such an interesting discussion of prejudice because this prejudice against funeral criers, you know, it's really a very stupid stupid superstition. But also, who doesn't understand this prejudice? What is your opinion on grave diggers or undertakers and people who do those type of jobs? Yet these jobs are essential for how our society runs. If a grave digger retires, another one gets hired, you could end up working as one. I mean, maybe not, I don't know your own situation. But the point is, there is a stigma around people who work with death. And that stigma is a little bit different in Chinese society to what it is in Western society, but it's very interesting learning about it. And we're not so much learning the minutia of funeral crying, but the role it plays in society and the different ways it is seen by different people. The dedication and the care that our funeral crier has for her job is on display too. She's in a pretty toxic relationship with a man who is probably cheating on her, who is definitely been unkind to her. I did struggle to tell if this unkindness was banter, the completely blunt way Chinese people can sometimes talk to each other, or just plain cruelty. It kind of doesn't matter either. In good banter, I frequently call my wife stupid. But the reality is, she is the smartest person I know. She knows she is the smartest person I know, and she's quite secure in her intelligence. But I also make sure that I tell her that too. And that sort of balance, that is missing from the relationship in this book. Not only is the husband's cruelty about her sagging breasts and ugly face never contradicted, they are things that the wife thinks about herself. He is preying on her insecurities, whether he knows it or not. He's also very vocal about not liking the work she did. But of course, he's all too happy to spend the money she makes. Now, our funeral crier starts to develop feelings for another man. And I love the way that this was written. I didn't know if the husband was actually cheating or if the wife was lying to herself and being an unreliable narrator to justify her own desire for infidelity. Or if it was the author being conscious of who the narrator was and exactly what she knew. We are left in doubt about if the husband is actually cheating. And that doubt, that doubt is the same doubt that the wife must be feeling in the book. And to create a feeling in the reader that matches the feeling that your character is going through. That is brilliant writing. There is also the theme of rural life and its disadvantages compared to Shanghai, where our couple's daughter lives, the concepts of family and love, the importance of passing down a name, and of course, death. If every author I read is as talented as Wei Yang Lu, then my reading would be greatly improved. This is a book that maybe is slightly lacking in his ambition, but I feel makes up for it with just a stunning execution of this novel. Martyr by Kaved Akbar. Cyrus is a young Irani man living in the US who inherits a payout from the US government after a flight which his mother was on board is shot down and she was subsequently killed. Cyrus is an alcoholic, he's an addict, and he's becoming obsessed with his uncle, a man nicknamed the Angel of Death for riding into battle for the sole purpose of comforting the dying. One day Cyrus discovers a painting of a man who just might be his uncle. It causes him to dig up his past and investigate, leading him to a terminally ill artist in New York. I can't help but to 
think of the cyclic nature of that. Cyrus finding this woman while she is dying, while looking for his uncle who looks after the dying, and the comfort he ultimately provides this woman and that she provides to him. This is quite a plotty book, and the plot is fantastic too, but it is one of these books that is quite challenging to review and avoid spoilers. You really do need to trust this author, buy into the book, and know that wherever you land, it's going to be satisfying and both an interesting and an enjoyable ride. Personally speaking, prose is not something I care too much about when I'm reading, but Akbar is very clearly talented at writing prose. You know, exactly the sort of thing you might expect from a poet turned author. Major themes in this novel include terminal illness, addiction, art, migration, abusive relationships, death, grief, and acceptance. I think the existential crisis that Cyrus went through could have been explored a little bit better. I did feel somewhat kept at a distance from Cyrus at times. I don't want to criticise Akbar's character work too much, lest you think that he did a poor job of it. Quite the contrary, his character work is second only to his plot work. But for me, this novel, it's a high four-star, almost five-star book. And this is one of the very, very few books where reviewing it and examining why it didn't quite reach a five-star perfection hasn't added to the novel for me. In fact, I feel like this is a novel that maybe I should have just left alone and had it be gloriously fading into the sunset. So very good but imperfect character work and exploration of themes result in a very good debut novel from an author I think you should all be watching. The Book of Mother by Violaine Hussman, translated from French by Leslie Cammy. This is a coming-of-age novel about a young woman called Violaine who grows up in a house in the shadows of her beautiful mother, Catherine. And this is much more a character portrait of the mother than it is a coming-of-age of the daughter. Catherine is such a flawed character. She borders on problematic and dislikable at times. She is clearly troubled, stressed, and fighting for her own place in the world too. And this is really summed up with the relationship Catherine has with the father of her two daughters. They're divorced. He is wealthy. She is not. He is older than her. The power dynamic is completely off. But she is willful to a fault. And you have to ask, who is really in control of this relationship? And how do you know that? And in the exploration of that question, it forces you to challenge your own perceptions why do you think he or she is in control of this relationship? Sex is another example where our perceptions are really challenged by this novel. Catherine is clearly a very sexual woman who is stunning and has no shortage of admirers. But some of the sex appears to be quite questionable. And you have to wonder, is she being exploited? Or is she enjoying it? Other times it appears that she is using sex to get what she wants. But also, this is just a woman who enjoys sex and wants a lot of it. So, is she using it to get what she wants? And is what she wants just sex? And I think it really leaves us questioning. Is this two consenting adults? Or sometimes more than two consenting adults? Or is she being exploited or even exploiting the people she has had sex with? The sex question is further complicated by the breadcrumbs of depression that Hussman includes. Maybe she's having sex to feel good about herself. I've probably made that seem like sex is a much more central theme to this novel than it is. But I often like to explore examples to give an idea of what this book is doing. And I think what this book is doing is challenging you to ask who this character is and why do you think that? Is that based on societal conditioning? I really love that nothing is simple in this novel. It's as if the entire point of it is to demonstrate that no human is black or white, that no incident is entirely good or evil, that no character is unflawed. It asks a lot and expects a lot from us, the reader, this book. And I love that we are trusted with a novel like this. Catherine's mothering skills, her relationship with men and sometimes women, her attitudes to life, they all impact the growing up of Violaine and her sister. But as she nears adulthood, we start to realise that Catherine's erratic parenting is much more about her mental health than her children knew. And this adds another layer. We sort of start to re-examine 
everything that she did before through another lens. This is darkly funny. The prose is beautiful. It has amazing character work. This was both such an easy book and such a hard book to read because it was so digestible, but it really does force you to empathize with the characters completely and forgivingly. The plot could have been about these characters watching paint dry, and I really would have been engaged by this book. I really like this book. It's just a fantastic novel. Both the author and the translator should be very proud. The Husbands by Holly Gramazio. As a little aside, I want to ask you, what is the difference between a good book and a successful book? Are they always the same thing? Now, one day, Lauren returns home to her flat to find her husband, Michael. The issue is, she doesn't have a husband, Michael. She's never met the bloke before. But to her surprise, she finds photos of their wedding day and an entire text conversation with him on her phone. Then Michael goes up to the attic to change the faulty light bulb and he is replaced by a completely new husband. Lauren has a magical husband swapping attic. And if she doesn't like the man who's walking down from it, all she has to do is send him back up, ask him to replace a light bulb, and she gets an entirely new one. If you are looking for a deep read probing the purpose of relationships and how the people we happen to meet shape the world around us and who we are in that world, then this isn't the book you're looking for. If you want a novel that isn't taking itself seriously at all, that is both funny and charming and simply a good time, then this is the perfect novel for you. The premise of this book is somewhat ridiculous and the book treats that with the solemnity it deserves. Lauren also tackles ethical dilemmas in this book, considering that she has an unlimited supply of husbands. Is it fair to send one back to the attic if he simply has bad taste in t-shirts? Or is she obligated to get to know him first? On her adventures, Lauren meets a nudist husband, discovers that in an alternative universe, she's a swinger, and wonders, is it okay to stay with her Swedish billionaire husband, who does appear to be somewhat ethically challenged? This will never be the best book I read, but this was 100% successful in what it was intending to do. And hence my opening question. This is the perfect book for when you want something a little lighter, a little silly, a little fun. This is a brilliant Sunday afternoon cocktail read. James by Percival Everett. Hats off to Percival Everett. I did not like the trees. I DNF'd Dr. No. I was done with Everett. But a retelling of Huckleberry Finn from the point of view of Jim? Well, I just have to read that. And I'm sure you're aware that this book is getting a lot of hype at the moment. And yeah, let me tell you, this hype is real. A 4.6 average rating on Goodreads? Literary fiction doesn't get that. And the thing that really boggles my mind here is this is not a completely new style for Everett. You can see the mixing of darkness and the humour that he was trying to do in the trees. That mixing, which was ultimately why some people got on so well with that book and other people didn't. But in James, he's really perfected it. So let's talk about the man who is beating Jane Austen up with her own shin bone in the corner of the room, Mark Twain. You don't need to have read Huckleberry Finn to enjoy James, but you will get more out of this book if you have. Personally, it has been a number of years since I read Huckleberry Finn, and Everett is very good at reminding you of the scenes and triggering memories. Definitely no need to reread Huckleberry Finn, unless of course you want an excuse to do that, in which case, go for it. Telling the story from Jim's point of view does give Everett a little bit of license to create things too, as Jim isn't with Huck the whole time. Everett has reimagined parts of Huck Finn too, the relationship between Huck and Jim. I don't believe that that is consistent with Twain's version of Huck, but it is an excellent example of when an author can ignore the original text because this change adds to the themes and experiences. And when you figure out what Everett is doing with it, you get to re-look at the whole story, whether it's Everett's version or Twain's, in a completely different light. 
Now, Mark Twain over the years has been called both a racist and an anti-racist. Huck Finn is definitely a racially problematic novel. And yes, it was written in a time where we had different views about race and all of that, but in today's society, it is a racially problematic novel. I am not criticising Twain, I am just stating a fact. Everett takes some of those problematic things and he twists them. James teaches incorrect English to other slaves leading us to the delightful line, that is the correct, incorrect English. The idea that black people are somehow less intelligent than white people is really wrapped up in our own ideas around education. Can I challenge you right now, you who is watching this? There is a fact that black people are on average from poorer families, from poorer neighbourhoods. They attend less prestigious schools. They are less likely to seek future education after high school. Do you think that this fact accounts for the IQ gap between black and white people? Now I looked this up and academically this this is true. Here is a paper. It's written by three white people. Here's another paper. It's written by two white people. Or this paper. It's written by two white people, one of who is an economist. Or this one, written by another white guy. My point here is not that white people cannot make observations about the IQ of black people. My point is that academia, and hence education, is a white-dominated institution. It was created by white people who lived white people lives, and who didn't value, acknowledge, or understand either the struggles faced by or the virtues existing within black people. Intentionally or accidentally, it doesn't matter which, academia is biased against black people. And academia is really an institution that seeks to normalise the white experience and ask black people to conform to the values that it has, which makes education unattractive to black people, which weirdly henceforth makes it even more unattractive to black people because fewer black people in an industry creates fewer black people in that industry. So when Everett has James teaching this class to the other black people, Everett is not only making a point about black people intentionally acting stupid around white people for matters of safety at the time as well. He's not only making a point that black people are much more capable than white people think, but he is also providing a role model for any black person wanting to pursue higher education. And all this is criticising the bias in Twain's work. Twain's depiction of Jim and the other black characters was as unintelligent. His depiction lacks the understanding of the black situation at the time, and it prioritises the accounts of white people. Twain is not acknowledging that by being white, Black people might not trust him, they might not interact with him the same as they do with other black people. And therefore, hence, he is not the best judge of their intelligence. So actually, I lied to you. My point was that white people shouldn't judge black people's intelligence. Education is but one example of where Everett has taken what Twain has said, acknowledged it, and called him a damn fool. And while James is completely rewriting some points of Twain's novel, he is doing it in conversation with Twain. Everett is not seeking to usurp or censor Twain's novel in any way, but to create conversation around it, to talk about the problematic things, to use it, to better our society. And I make this next comment as an Australian who has never visited America, but surely this is a conversation that is very relevant to American life. And as such, this should be an early favourite for the 2025 Pulitzer Prize. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see this get nominated or even win the National Book Award or the Booker Prize, but this just seems such a quintessentially modern and important American novel that I cannot help but to think it is the perfect candidate for the Pulitzer. Everett has created a truly exceptional novel and absolute credit to Everett. I didn't think he could write a novel this this good. And I'm delighted to be shown that I am also, like Mark Twain, a damn fool for thinking that of him. If you'd like to help this channel grow, please subscribe. Help me get to 4K soon. And remember, it's free to like this video too. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.